imagine, if you will, and this will not be hard if you were even semi-conscious during the Hays Code era, or know anything about recent queer history, a story wherein all our heroes are cis and straight. In fact, everyone is cis and straight, with one notable exception. The villain of our tale is gay. Not only is he gay, his reason for villainy is directly tied to his sexuality. And of course, by the end of the film, he is either dead or carted off in chains. A morally correct punishment for his sin, if you will. Now take that, and make the villain disabled instead. This is obviously not a one-to-one -one comparison, because no minority's struggles will ever perfectly mirror another's, but it serves well enough as a jumping-off point. I've been making videos on disability in media for a while, and again and again I keep coming back to this point, and I keep getting comments from people who are confused about it. What, exactly, is wrong with a disabled villain? Or a villain with a facial difference, because not all facial differences stem from disability, but the two do intersect a lot, so I'll be touching on that a bit later. In a vacuum? Nothing. Disabled people are just that. People. We come in all different shapes and sizes, and are just as capable of good and bad as any other person. But we do not live in a vacuum, and our media is shaped by extant tropes and harmful stereotypes. So what, exactly, is wrong with the disabled villain? Let's start with the most obvious. Nine times out of ten, when there is a disabled villain in the story, that villain will be the only disabled character. Or, in the case of Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader, the disabled hero will be disabled in such a way that is easy for both the writers and the able-bodied audience to ignore, while one of the most iconic things about the disabled villain is the mechanical sound of his breathing apparatus. But Star Wars is still one of the better examples of a disabled villain, because while Vader is disabled, his motivation for his actions isn't rooted in those disabilities. And the hero who stands opposite him is, as I've already mentioned, also disabled. Though, again, Luke doesn't really serve as fantastic representation given how easy it is to forget that he's an amputee. Additionally, Vader gets to be badass, ominous, and powerful while being disabled in a way that isn't often seen. He is feared and most certainly never viewed as weak by those around him, but even among disabled villains, he kind of stands out in the fact that he's so physically ominous rather than playing mind games or sitting in the shadows and plotting. Though Vader did lead to, or at least popularized, the trope of the Dark Lord on life support, as TV Tropes dubs it, I find him a lot more palatable than most disabled villains. In general, the Dark Lord on life support is a more palatable trope to me, because it tends to have less to do with disability specifically, and serve more as a commentary on the extremely wealthy who desperately cling to life, and power, and refuse to face death as a natural part of life. Darth Vader obviously isn't that, but most Dark Lords on life support tend to be emperors or billionaires, hunting for ways to extend their lives and damn the consequences. Which isn't exactly new, that's been happening in real life since as far back as the 200s BC. So obviously, a disabled villain can be done, in a way that doesn't raise too many eyebrows. Why, then, am I making an entire video on why you probably shouldn't disable your villains? That would be because Vader is the exception, not the rule. And while I feel more positive about him, he's still far from perfect. Most disabled villains tend to fall into one of two categories. Number one, turn to evil because of the oppression they've faced. Or number two, so desperate not to be disabled anymore that they're going to commit war crimes about it. 
Obviously, there's overlap, and a particular villain can be a little of column A, a little of column B, but that's the general trend I've noticed. Additionally, it is extremely rare for a disabled villain to exist opposite a disabled hero. Or really, any other disabled character who could challenge their assertions? On the rare occasion that both a disabled hero and villain exist, you can bet that more often than not, the disabled villain will be the more severe case, for lack of a better term, or look more disturbing to an able-bodied audience. Again, see Star Wars episodes 4 through 6. This seems like a good point to clarify a common misconception I've noticed about villains with facial differences. So many times when I've raised the point that perhaps we should stop doing that, I get about a hundred people jumping to point out that, oh, but heroes have facial scars too. Which, yeah, sure, but here's the thing. A hero's facial scarring will almost never be truly severe. Characters like Alistair Moody, as much as I hate to give Joanne credit for anything, or Zuko are the exception, not the rule. A hero's facial scar will be a nick across the forehead or their cheek. Once in a while, there might be an eye patch involved if they're more morally grey. A villain, on the other hand? A villain can suffer disabling burns, or require a prosthetic jaw, or have a Glasgow smile, or a facial difference they were born with. Because they're not the hero, writers feel comfortable giving them quote-unquote disturbing faces and go about their days without considering what that means to the people who actually look like the villains they've just created. It's the same for almost any disability. The more obvious it is, the more likely that character is going to be a villain. I don't think I need to clarify why that's a problem. As I already briefly mentioned, the most common form of disabled villain in media is a manipulator of some kind. The scheming vizier who walks with a limp, the evil genius wheelchair user who uses their perceived helplessness to avoid suspicion, the puppet master behind the scenes who lies and deceives and takes joy in the pain of others. Or, alternatively, there's the inhuman monster approach, most commonly given to little people who tend to only show up in media as either non-human fantasy creatures or as sadistic monsters usually motivated by the cruelty they faced growing up. But, because our disabled villain is evil and doing bad things now, any legitimate grievance they might have is neatly swept under the rug by the end of the story. Take, for example, a villain who is motivated to cruelty by the cruelty he faced growing up disabled. A classic hurt people hurt people situation. But, because the heroes he squares off against are able-bodied, there is no one in the story to empathize with him. Once the villain is taken care of, every legitimate point they made is quickly and efficiently swept under the rug, undermined by the fact that the only person in the story who stood by those ideals also committed atrocities. On the rare occasion that the heroes have a disabled teammate, that teammate might take a moment in the final showdown to empathize with the villain and tell him, this isn't the right way to go about things. That's, of course, better than just having the disabled villain stand alone, but again, we run into the problem of once the villain is dealt with, the status quo returns, and nothing is ever done about what the villain's legitimate grievance was. This is the problem with having your marginalized antagonist be motivated by their marginalization. You have to be willing to sit down and consider that they might be right about some stuff. Which means your protagonists might be kind of in the wrong. And that's not the kind of story everyone is equipped to write. Then there's the disabled villain who despises their disability and would do anything to be rid of it. This is a classic situation of able-bodied people looking at disabled people and deciding there's no way we could possibly be truly happy. Obviously, there are disabled people who would take a cure if it was available, but this trope is absolutely born from the able-bodied view that every single one of us must be miserable 
stories like this tend to treat villainy as a logical outcome of disability. Again, most times this disabled villain will stand opposite a team of able-bodied heroes and their search for a cure will be framed as doomed but understandable, almost inevitable, with no other disabled person around to just say, the fuck are you on about? The unfortunate implication of these stories is, once again, that being disabled is always and without fail a miserable existence. Which isn't exactly the most fun thing to run across when I'm trying to relax and consume some interesting stories. In conclusion, this seems like an obvious point to make, but apparently I have to actually say it. If your villain is part of a minority group, and their entire motivation comes from being part of that minority group, and there are no other characters in your story who come from that same minority group, you might have a problem. Additionally, the fact that so many villains are deceivers by nature further feeds into the stereotype of disabled people lying or exaggerating or being general leeches on society, which obviously is, um, not a good thing. Thank you for watching this video. If you liked it, consider liking it and maybe subscribing. I will be back here Thursday after next. Bye.